Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to the Battles We All Face Mind, Body and Soul podcast. I am your host, John Morris, the artist, author and coach for the creative mind. And welcome to our special. We have got such a special episode for you this month because my guest today has penned nearly 40 books in the genre of contemplative and contemporary spirituality. He has also developed it into practical application for everyday life and includes the nine book Conversation with God series. His works have included seven New York Times bestsellers and his titles are read around the world and translated into 37 different languages. He is the creator of Conversations with God Connect, which is a global platform for people to go deeper in the conversations with God body of work. His latest book, which we're going to be talking about in this show, The God Solution, has reached people near and far since its publication. And to set the tone for this show, we want you to ponder one question. Is it possible that there is something that we don't understand about God and don't understand about life? And if we did, if we had that understanding, would it change everything? Please welcome my awesome guest, Neil Donald Walsh. Neil, how are you doing today? Well, I'm kind of scared and a little bit nervous and trembling <laughs> because after that introduction, I don't know if I could possibly live up to all those words. What am I going to do? Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me here, John, and goodbye for now because I'm too nervous to go <laughs> on with the program. It's- it is an absolute pleasure. <laughs> See, folks, th- this is a sign of things to come more than anything else. So Neil and I off air have already been having a few laughs and uh, <laughs> it's going to be a great show for sure. Uh, Neil, we're going to begin some rapid fire questions. Are you are you okay with that? Are you ready for that? Of course. Okay, so let's begin. Where were you born? I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is in the upper Midwest of the United States. What was your father's occupation? He worked for the post office, and he worked for the post office for forty years. He wound up uh, ending his career as a um, as a supervisor, as actually as a postmaster. He wound up being a postmaster of a, of a relatively small suburb of Milwaukee, but he, he spent his entire career uh, as uh, a postal employee. Wow, that is super cool. What was your mother's occupation? She was a homemaker and probably the best you could ever have hoped for. A marvelous, marvelous person who never really left the side of her children or her husband. Uh, she was a typical, I think, uh, House homemaker, housewife from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, she lived a, a life that was devoted to those that she loved. Wow, that is incredible to, to hear that. And when did you become first aware of the divine spirit of God working inside you? Well, that's a, two, two different questions. When did I first become aware of the divine spirit of God when I was seven, six or seven years old? working inside me when I was uh, 49 or 51 years old. So those are are two different questions. Mm -hmm. I was born and raised as a Roman Catholic. My my parents sent me to a Catholic uh, elementary school. And and so my my first sense of life in general uh, was uh, in that environment. And that's where I learned about uh, the existence of God and who and what God is based on the teachings of that uh, theology. But only when I was, uh, as I said a minute ago, only when I had just about turned 50 mm-hmm. did I did I begin asking questions, uh, serious questions, about all that I had been told and taught. And that's when I began my conversation with God. I think it's uh, fantastic, and it actually parallels a lot of my own life, because it's similar to you. I was raised uh, Roman Catholic, uh, and f- for me, there was always something, I don't know, whenever somebody would experience and talk about spirituality or uh, Catholicism, and, and they would all bow their heads and beat their chest, and I'm thinking, you talk about the good news every, for us, it was every Saturday night, and it was like, did the good news ever get out? That, that's, I think, even as a five-year-old child, I was often asking that because you would see these people, very, very wonderful and well-intentioned people, but that would have the most long and miserable downcast face. And um, now that I look back, I'm sure we'll touch on this, you know, throughout the show, it was, um, 
something was missing, I think. But but it gave, like yourself, it gave that exposure to um, God, to divine spirit, to to a teaching and a structure um, that I think at that point, you know, was just very much needed and, and served me all, all the way throughout my uh, throughout my life, really. So it was uh, it's most interesting that, that we, we share that parallel. Um, your book, The God Solution, opens up with this popular question. If God exists, why is the world always such a mess? What answer do you have for someone who asks that question? You're going to hell for asking the question. <laughs> now, that, now, that's a John Higgy uh, kind of response. There. <laughs> there is a hell, and you're going there. <laughs> no, I, I uh, it's to be serious for just a moment, I, uh, I tell people that it's not God's job, as I understand it, mm -hmm. to make uh, everything better on the earth. Uh, it's not God's job to uh, make decisions and choices for us or to force her will on us. Um, it's God's intention, God's desire to empower us, all sentient beings in the cosmos, actually, to create our own reality. I, I, my understanding and my belief is that the essence and the energy and the, um, the, the entity that we call God desires to replicate itself. It's, its greatest desire is the same desire that all of life has. Mm -hmm. You will notice that all of life replicates itself in one way or another. Not just human beings, but virtually every aspect of life has some process by which it replicates itself. And so um, God chose to replicate itself. And in so doing, uh, she understood perfectly well that for us to be replications of the divine, we would have to be given, proportionate to our size, in, in, in proportion to who we are, the power to create. That way we could all be creators even as God is the creator of all things everywhere. So uh, life on earth is such a mess. If there really is a God, why is life such a mess? Because we are creating it that way right. and have been creating it that way for thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands of years. Because we've never really fully understood who and what God is, who and what we are, and fully embraced, much less fully utilized, the power within us that God has bestowed and inserted within us, in, to speak metaphorically, to allow us to, in fact, produce and create our own reality. I think that was very succinctly and very well put. Um, you know, I, I think oftentimes that God often gets the brunt of the responsibility, and people fail to actually accept on themselves that God may be the creator, but we are the maintainers. You know, it's up to us. You, to... you know, I, I don't think it was God's intention for us to become minions. No. You know, we, we simply we simply follow the rules, do as we're told, you know, and, and then God will be good to us. That, that wasn't God's intention. No. God's intention was not for us to be minions, but for us to be manifestors of our own reality, creators, if you please. And so um, that's the huge difference in my understanding and the understanding that I was given uh, when I was a child and a young man. You know, I want to share something with you, John, if I can, what, what really caused me to, to, st to stop and take notice of what I was being told. I was nine years old when I was told uh, the difference between mortal and venial sin. The, for those of you who are not familiar with the Catholic theology, those are two categories of offenses against God that we are taught by the Catholic Church. There's such a thing as a venial sin, which is more or less of a spiritual misdemeanor, and then there's a mortal sin, which is a sin that's, that's a, a grave offense against God. Now, the priest of our parish came into our classroom once a week for about a half hour or so and taught the third grade uh, catechism, which is the doctrine and the dogma of the Catholic Church. On this particular son, on this particular Wednesday, in John, he came in and he told us about the difference about mortal and venial sin. And he said, now, as an example, children, you probably already know that it's a mortal sin if you miss Mass on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I thought about that, and I got kind of scared. 
because uh, as a fact, that week I did miss Mass without a good excuse. The priest allowed us to have, if we had a good excuse, caring for a sick parent, or maybe we're an adult and we have to, you know, our employment requires us to work on Sunday. Fair enough. But if you have no reason for missing Mass, you must go to Mass. And if you deliberately choose to miss Mass when you could have attended, and you are not forgiven that sin in a confessional by a priest, if you should get hit by a car, God forbid, and die or for some other reason expire, you will, in fact, go straight to hell. And that's what a mortal sin is about. And the priest was very clear about that in his teaching. Now, John, I'm nine years old. You know, I, I, I'm sitting there in the third grade trying to absorb this information about the maker of the universe. The creator of the entire cosmos is concerned about one entity out of countless, I can't even imagine the number, a gazillion, gazillion, gazillion entities in the universe who didn't go to Mass on Sunday because, you know, I went to play baseball that Sunday. And, you know, and I went, you know, what's funny is I was a devout young Catholic boy. I went almost every Sunday of my life and actually enjoyed it. Yeah. I was, I was an altar boy at one point and I served at Mass. So, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, the whole experience. But this particular Sunday I didn't know, he's telling me this on Wednesday, three days later, and I am shaking in my boots because this is a high authority figure. This is a priest telling me this. This isn't some kid in the playground. This is a man with a white collar around his neck telling me that I'm going to hell if that sin is not forgiven before I die. You know, so I'm lying in my bed. That I, we didn't have any confession in our parish until the next Saturday. I had three days to get through. And, and to, you know, if you don't think that'll make a nine year old look both ways when you're crossing the street, you don't think that'll make a nine-year-old quake in his boots when he's saying the prayer he's taught every to say every night, now I lay me down to sleep. I, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I beg the Lord my soul to take. I'm I'm crying saying that 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 prayer at, at the age of nine. God let me get through until Saturday. And then I go in, you know, and I confess my sin on Saturday. I didn't go to Mass last week, and I'm so nervous. Father, please forgive me. Tell me I'm okay with God. I don't want to go to hell. And the poor priest, <laughs> I'm sure he must have thought, oh, this poor nine-year-old kid. Um, but equally, from what you experienced, you know, that's not surprising. That, that you no, I had to, I realized they can't, re and somewhere along the way, I thought, this can't be the way it is. Yeah. This can't be the way it is. But talk about filling the pews with oh, yeah. fear. Yeah. Talk about using fear as a device to get you to come to church. Yeah. Wouldn't wouldn't love be a much better way to get us to come to church? Definitely. So I understand why people are beating their chest. Mea copa, mea copa, mea maxima yeah. copa, because you know, we don't want to offend a guy who's going to send you to hell if you miss church one week out of fifty-two. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand it. I mean, uh, and, and I'll share something i know our audience will already know this but i was a youth minister for close to 15 years and again even even from a, the age of a child i always thought differently i i you know when everyone would bow their heads and look down i would look up at the 50-foot statue of jesus um i had that real that that experience you know with, with jesus uh multiple times in my life and um you know, it, looking around, it was just like other people have had that, you know, relationship with religion a lot of the times. But as I grew and I grew, you know, there were times, even as a, as a teenager, where I was, things that, you know, Catholic folk would say or church folk would say just didn't make sense to me. It's like, well, why are you at war with the Baptists? And this is before I went to seminary and theological college and everything else. And you know, why Why don't you like the Baptists? And why don't you like the Church of Scotland? And why do you all, you know, fight with each other? And it was really in the last three years of my uh, official Christian ministry that, again, you know, you, you always feel that you've been led and you've been guided and all these promptings are there. And that's what was going on, that I was seeing things behind the curtain that just were not right. And I saw it in several different churches. And I'm thinking, I'm expected to sit here every Sunday morning and tell the kids, come to church, you know, follow Jesus, everything is going to be good, it's all going to be wonderful, and that's all you're allowed to talk about, not the real life skills, and as you say, you're not necessarily there to love people, you're not there to, to deal with all the things, and I thought, I just can't do this, and when I, uh, when I eventually did leave the church in 2016, for one reason or another, 
it took years to get over a lot of that hurt, pain and struggle that was there before I then, you know, went back to being prompted and, and encountered teachers like Wayne Dyer and, uh, and Sadhguru and Nisargadatta Maharaj and, and, and started being allowed to take control of my own, I, I use that in inverted commas, but start being allowed to take control of my own spiritual life as opposed to being told what to think and what to do. Um, and, you know, I often think, you know, when people come to, and, and they ask me the same question, you know, um, about the earth being horrible and the earth being terrible. And it's like, have you actually looked around? Have you seen a beautiful sunny day? Have you seen, you know, your, the grass growing? And have you, you know, and it sounds very, oh, you know, peace, man, you know, wonderful. We just love the earth. But when you actually really break it down and you see the small things that are going on, it, it, there is so much beauty that's there. And I think people oftentimes get so hooked up on the, the miserable and the, the frustrating and the angry because that's what either they've been conditioned to see or that's what they're looking for all the time. And I just come back and say, well, how do you know that you don't, you're, you're not living in heaven now? You know, <laughs> How do you know that this isn't heaven and you're making a mess out of it? And you always get these puzzled, uh, you know, faces and things. Um, but it's... How, I suppose the question that, that's in my mind from someone such as yourself, how do you see the Christian church now? And how do you understand it now? I want to be real careful, <laughs> but I don't start to sound like a Christian basher. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh -huh. I, I, I don't want anyone to think, oh, yeah. he, he's just bashing all religions, actually. So let me begin by saying something that's very important for me to, yeah. to share. I believe all the world's religions, and there are, most people aren't aware of this, but there are currently 4,300 separate religions being practiced on the face of the earth. But I think all the world's religions, and surely all the world's so-called great religions, you know, the major religions that, that count among their members, billions and billions of people, contain great wisdom, great insight, yes. great understanding, huge truths, and wonderful levels of awareness about life, and yes, about God, and about who we are as individuals. So we're not going to just, you know, to use a horrible analogy that we say in the United States, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have that in Scotland as well, yes. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, not, we're not going to suggest for a minute that religions are the culprit what I want to suggest is, and what I've been saying to people all over the world, whenever I talk in person or on this miracle that we call Zoom, uh, I say to people, religions don't have it wrong in the sense of it being totally false. But what I do think is true is that most religions, the dogmas of most religions are simply incomplete. They don't have all the data. So I see us the followers of those 4,300 religions, I see us almost, to use a metaphor, as ch children, almost as children who have learned how to add and subtract, and we think that's all there is to mathematics. You know, because, in fact, you could probably solve most mathematical problems with addition or subtraction. But there is, you know, multiplication and long division and algebra and geometry and higher mathematics. I mean, there's a great deal more to mathematics than the basics. So, so it would be wrong for us to think that we have all the information yeah. simply because we, you know, we, we stopped learning, we stopped searching for more information. I think the only mistake that the world's religions have made is stopping the search and imagining that what they've been handed down from their predecessors and their predecessors and their predecessors, I'm reminded of the statement, and the sins of the father shall be visited upon the sons, yea, even unto the seventh generation. Well, so we're, we're operating today on what we've been told hundreds and hundreds and many hundreds of years ago. If we, you know, if we did that in science, mm -hmm. we'd be trying to send a rocket to the moon using a, a stick of dynamite. Yes. If we did that in medicine, we'd be doing brain surgery with a very sharp stick. If, if we kept on using first century tools to solve 21st century problems, we would not be getting very far. And in fact, we're not. Because we refuse to do one thing that people in science and medicine and technology do routinely. 
question the prior assumption. Yeah. The reason, John, that we've made such enormous progress, and we have made enormous oh, yeah. progress as a civilization, is that when science discovers something, when scientists you know, conduct an experiment and uh, you know, land on, on something, the first thing they do is question it. They question the prior assumption. They don't hold it as sacred. They look at it deeply and they question it every which way from Sunday, speaking about Sunday, to in order for them to be sure that what they've come to understand uh, and is is what's now so. And that willingness to question the prior assumption is what has caused us to make new discoveries and new discoveries and new discoveries. The same thing occurs in medicine. The same thing occurs in technology. We wouldn't have, and man, you know, my friend, I'm holding the world in my hand over here. I couldn't have imagined anything like this even 30 years ago yeah. when I was 50 years old. Yeah. I couldn't have imagined anything like this because but we have been willing to question the prior assumption in every area of our life except the area where it's most important, the area of our most sacred beliefs. There, we're not supposed to question the prior assumption. We're supposed to assume that what we were told thousands of years ago is the way it is is. So I ask my readers in the book, The God Solution, what if, just what if we don't have it all correct? What if there's something we don't fully understand yet about ourselves, about God, about life, the understanding of which could change everything? And I say to my friends, my Christian friends, my Jewish friends, my Muslim friends, my Buddhist friends, the friends of every of one of the faith traditions, I say to my friends, do you think it's possible, just, just possible, that there's something we don't know here, that there's something we don't fully, fully, fully understand about God? If they say, no, no, there's nothing we don't know. It's right there in the book, Neil. It's right there in the book. Just read the book. Then, of course, I have to ask them, which book would you be talking about? The Quran, yes. the Bhagavad Gita, the Book of Mormon? Are you, are you talking about the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament? Are you talking about, because there are only 237 holy scriptures on the planet right now saying, oh, it, I got it. It's the Bhagavad Gita. Why didn't I know? It, it was the Bhagavad Gita. So which book is it in, my friend? Yeah. And then they'll tell you the book I'm holding, the book that I believe in. I say, oh, I see. Yeah. So that's the signal to me of a closed mind. But I have been advised by the God of my understanding Keep your mind open. There is something still to be understood by the largest number of people. And here's what I think it is. I know I've launched off here onto a 20-minute okay. lecture, <laughs> but I want to I want to since you've given me the floor for a minute, you'll you'll rue the day when you and you when you did. It's when the gold nuggets come out. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that what humanity is invited to do now is embrace a daring new definition of God to define the higher power in a new way. This is not a small thing, uh, John. I don't know whether you're aware of it, but surveys have been taken in the past eight or 10 years in most of the countries of the world where anthropologists and survey takers have simply asked a simple question, one question. So one question survey. Do you believe in a higher power? Yeah. And eight out of 10 people have said in all the cultures of the world have said, oh yeah, they believe in a higher power. They may not, we may not agree on what the power is, how to define it, what it wants, if it wants anything, what it does if it does not get what it wants, how to use the power. Is the power available to us? They may not a, agree on the so-called fine print, but eight out of 10 people agree there's more going on here than meets the eye. Yes, there is a higher power. So this is not a small thing when I suggest that we redefine that higher power. So what the God Solution offers, and I was inspired to put this into a book, is a brand new definition of God. Let's imagine what would change on the earth and in our lives if we decided that God could be defined in two words. Pure love. Yeah. Now, John, when I say this in front of a live audience, someone inevitably gets up in the back of the room, oh, Mr. Walsh, come on. I've been sitting here for 20 minutes listening to you for you to give me this great revelation that God is love. Everybody knows that God is love. Even those 4,000 religions you talk about agree on that point. No, no, no religion says that God is not love. Of course God is love. 
Did I come here tonight to hear this? Big revelation? And I say, well, we'll, we'll relax. We'll, we'll relax. I didn't say that God is love. That's not what I said. I said, God is pure love. There's a difference. Now my friend in the back of the room will say, okay, that's the difference. So the difference is that pure love needs, requires, expects, hopes for, and certainly demands nothing in return. Now, folks, that's theologically revolutionary because virtually every religion on the face of the earth and certainly all the world's major religions teach that there are things that God expects, requires, and demands. And if God doesn't get those things that he re expects, requires, and demands, he will judge, condemn, and punish us. So we know then that while God is love, God expresses love through various tools, not the least of which are judgment, condemnation, and punishment. God has to punish us if we don't do what God demands because heavenly justice requires it. You can't have unjust people coming to heaven, so you have to send them to hell because they didn't obey the commandments, because they didn't go to church every Sunday of their life without fail. And if they did fail to go to church every Sunday and didn't get to confession fast enough, yeah. and they got hit by a car, God forbid, on the street, they will go to hell. To say nothing about if they actually got a divorce or actually masturbated and pleasured themselves or did a whole list of things that we call mortal sins. So when I say that God is pure love, that God requires and expects and demands nothing of us, I'm proposing a theological revolution. I'm, I'm inviting us to embrace a notion of the higher power. I'm saying, yes, there is a higher power, but the higher power does not need anything from us, any more than we would need something from a six-month-old baby in our arms. I mean, if you're holding a six-month-old infant in your arms, and hopefully most of us have had that lovely experience at least once in their life, and if the baby happens to have an unfortunate biological accident, do we say to the baby, it's okay, I forgive you? Forgiveness is not even part of the equation. We actually smile at the innocence of this pure essence of life. Even as God smiles at our innocence, that we could have thought for a minute that she would send us to everlasting damnation for missing Sunday service once in your life. So to say nothing of the other long list of sins that we are given that we are not to commit, so, theological revolution that it is, if we embrace the notion of a God who expects, demands, and requires nothing of us, that would create, John, a new ethic, a new moral foundation, not just for spirituality, but for politics, economics, and social interactions on this planet. Because currently, we're using our present understanding of God as our spiritual foundation. God is judgmental, condemning, and punishing with us. We, therefore, That's can true. be judgmental, condemning, and punishing with each other. Therefore, we say to each other the same thing that God says to us. We're simply imitating God, yeah. which is supposedly a good thing to do. So nations say to other nations, you better do what I want or I'll bomb the hell out of you. I will kill thousands of you if you don't agree where our borderline is. Or we say to other people, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to get this medicine to you, but we, we, we can't share our, our medicine with you in, in this particular country 
because there are lots of obligations, lots of challenges, lots of blockades in the way. So you're just going to have to die from, you know, from the illnesses that you're encountering. But if you lived in, a, in one of the other countries of the world, you would not have to die because you're just in the wrong geographical location. You know, and we, are you kidding? And we treat each other horribly, insanely because of something like the color of their skin. Yeah. yeah. I mean, really? What kind of a civilization behaves like that? Isn't it time that we simply admitted? There must be something we don't fully understand here. The understanding of which would change everything. It would, absolutely. And I think, folks, go back and listen to that over and over because when you really absorb what has just been said, you can understand how our entire world has not only been created and conditioned um but you can also understand really what the answer is you know the, the minute i say god or i say jesus especially over here in in, in the uk the shutters always come down sure say, people run the other way yeah yeah people do as soon as i say divine spirit people kind of look at you curious all i've done i've talked about the exact same thing i've actually made god more holy verbally it's not possible but verbally and people's understanding. And when I say to them that they're a divine spirit having a temporary human experience, it makes them all feel warm and fuzzy. Now, if I just came out on a Sunday morning and said, you're God, or you're, you're part of God, and you're filled with this Holy Spirit in church language, like you said, they would run the other way. I think more than anything, to really sum up what, what you said there, I think it'd be summed up in one sentence. When you change your thoughts, you'll change your world. And the reason that we have the world that we have right now is because of a reflection of people's thoughts. The internal, sorry, the external will always reflect the internal. So if you see a pe person that's running around angry, frantic, and this is on a consistent basis, you know what's going on in their internal world and what's being fed. But honestly, I, I think, Neil, that you said it best, um, and I've experienced this in my own life, so I can verify this, some 30 years difference between us, that when you, you when you're willing to be led and to be guided, and I'm processing everything that you're saying here, it is amazing because I I you know I went to theological college. I was a you know a minister, youth minister for 15 years. I read that Bible from cover to cover in pretty much every version that still exists, and the amazing thing was when I went through this divine experience that I had two years ago, I encountered Wayne Dyer and then I encountered Sadhguru and Alan Watts and I learned about the Tao and I learned about Buddha and I learned about uh, all, many of the religious books of which you quoted. And I sat and I listened to them over and over and over and over again. The change was incredible. And, and don't get me wrong, there are some, you, you will go to church and you'll meet some wonderful people. You'll go to synagogue. Oh, of and course. You'll, of you'll course. meet some wonderful people. We don't, as, as you rightly said earlier on. And you, will hear some, and you will hear some wonderful things, Absolutely. some great wisdom, yeah. enormous wisdom. But, it's just incomplete. Correct. And that's what I'm starting to discover now, because if people ask me, first of all, what, you know, who am I? I just say, I am. It's the easiest thing, and people like that. It means there's no labels and there's no religions, and I dropped all of that a long time ago. But what I found, if people really push me, I said at the moment, I'm probably somewhere in the line of a Christian Buddhist Native American <laughs> in terms of my, my own spiritual development, uh, you know, with, with a little bit of, you know, uh, Vishnu and, and, uh, and Sadhguru's teachings and other things thrown in there. So what I'm learning, though, is, is the more that you read and the more that you study, the more you will really find to be truth. And as you said, you know, I find it interesting when people, and it doesn't matter the faith and religion, when they say to me, I'm in pursuit of the religion, I'm in pursuit of the truth. And I'm thinking, okay, well, what, what, what are you reading in pursuit of truth? And they'll say, well, I'm reading the Bible and I'm reading, you know, theological commentaries and Matthew Henry and the others. And I'm like, so you're in pursuit of Christian truth. And it's like, again, like you said, it's, it's, it's a tiny bit. When you step away from it, 
there is so much more. It's like you open Pandora's box and oh my goodness, the whole universe just, just cries out and screams out. And honestly, the, that there is so much in all of these different practices that is there that I think really would change our politics, would change our business. It would get rid of conservative and liberal, you know, and actually I, I would love to see, you know, both parties, you know, certain members have to be forced to work together, certainly over here as well. Um, and just really think about, you know, are we actually doing the best for our people that's, that's there? Um, we, we could go on and on and on, you know, what, what do you think then is, is the start to really begin to change things on, on maybe not even a global scale, but just really where we're at. How can we start to change things for ourselves, for the people around us, and then for that to spread? Ask ourselves a number of fundamental foundational questions. Who am I? Where am I? Why am I where I am? And what do I intend to do about that? Mm -hmm. I call these the four fundamental questions of life. And I ask myself these questions most mornings when I get up. I advise people, get a magic marker and write them, you know, in a little corner of your mirror in your bathroom. So that when you look in the mirror in the morning, and you're preparing for the day, you'll see those four questions and you'll answer the questions. And your answers could change from day to day, but they will be your truth in that moment. Who am I? Where am I? What is this place I'm in? I don't mean what room of the house or what country on earth or what planet. I mean, like, where am I in the overall scheme of things? What is this realm that I find myself in? Why am I where I am? And what do I intend to do about that? And when we answer those questions, we will discover that, oh, what we've done is we've created an agenda of the soul. And then I invite one other question that I that can help people get back on track and move closer to the ultimate reality of who they are. When things occur in your life, maybe, you know, maybe you have a little tiff, a little, little, little squabble, no big deal, but just a little disagreement with the person you're sharing your house with or sharing your bed with or sharing your neighborhood with or sharing your world with. You're having some kind of a disagreement, some kind of a little squabble. And when that comes up in my life, I look at that person across the room or across the street or across the pillow next to me. And I think to myself, what does this have to do with the agenda of my soul? Yeah. Wait a minute. There's more going on here than meets the eye. This is another moment when I get to decide, when I get to decide who I really am yeah. and why I have made that choice and what do I intend to do about it. You know, what's sad for me, John, is that People can't even love each other with pure love that wants, expects, demands nothing in return. So no wonder we can't imagine a God who would do that because we can't imagine doing it ourselves. We can't even get to a place where we love the person lying next to us, spending a lifetime with us in a way that says to them, you know what? I want, need, expect, even hope for nothing in return for loving you. Because I don't love you to see what I can get back. If I love you because of what you can give me, then I'm simply loving me mm -hmm. yes. through you. But if I love you absent any need, even hope that I'll get anything back from you, now I'm loving you purely. I'm saying, you know what? I love you because of who you are. I, I, totally, I totally get the wonder and the beauty and the magnificence of you, whether you give me any of that back or not. And that's why I love you. And so it's a skill that we are invited to acquire. Now, when I talk like this in front of an audience, my friend in the back of the room says, yeah, 
right. Yeah. Even if they're even if they're beating you over the head, punching you in the face, even if they're not leaving when you tell them to leave, even if you even if they don't obey what you say is the, the boundary line, the border of your country. You're invading their country because they won't give you half their country that they what do you say to that, Mr. Walsh? And I say, well, um, I don't know. I'm, a couple of words come to mind. Bless. Bless. Bless your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. And do good to those who would do you harm. And when a man slaps you on the right cheek, turn and offer him your left. And when a man steals your coat give him your shirt as well and when a man demands that you walk one mile with him go with him twain and raise not your fist to heaven and curse the darkness not but be a light unto the darkness that you might know who you really are and that all those whose lives you touch might know who they really are as well. But be careful. If you actually behave like this, somebody is liable to walk up to you and say, by whose authority are you acting like this? And then you'll face a moment of decision. You'll have to explain to them who you are and who you know that they are. I am an individuation of divinity. And so is every sentient being in this cosmos even those with whom we disagree, even those who have forgotten or never even understood from the beginning who they really are. You know what's interesting? People act the way they do out of fear because we've been told by our anthropologists that the basic instinct is survival. I recall being told that in my last year of high school in some class we were some ethics class we were being taught. Survival is the basic instinct. And when I brought that up to God, she said, oh, Neil, 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 sweetheart. Survival isn't the basic instinct. If survival is the basic instinct, you wouldn't run into traffic to save the child who's run out in front of a bus. You wouldn't run into the burning building because you hear some woman crying from the third floor, help. You wouldn't stand between the person who has a gun facing your loved one and your loved one. You wouldn't say to that person, you're going to have to shoot me first. If survival were the basic instinct, you would do none of those things. But we all do all of those things when the chips are down. So the fundamental instinct is not survival. It's the expression of your true nature, which is divinity. When people say to me, that, you know, that, that sounds so sweet, Neil. Oh, you put it so nicely. I wish I could really live that way, but I don't know how to get there. Give me a formula. How can I get to that place that you're describing? I say, okay, here's the formula. Consider every moment a burning building moment. Because if you did find yourself walking down the street one day, oh my God, the building's on fire. Does anybody see in the building? Oh my, there's, there's a, a woman inside. You wouldn't think twice. Yeah. You would run in and do what you could to help that woman out of there. And you wouldn't be thinking, you know, 
I could die in there. I might not live 20 more minutes. My life could be over in 20 minutes. You wouldn't be concerned about whether you live 20 minutes or 20 more years. Your only concern would be, how oh, am I going to live? Because in moments like that, the question becomes imperative. Yeah. Who am I? Now, who am I? I've had a gun put pointed at me, a live gun ammunition, twice in my life, in two different experiences. One was a submachine gun mm -hmm. in a third world country that I won't mention. And one was an angry husband who caught me with his wife. Not a smart thing for me to do. And I, while I'm with this lady, we hear the footsteps. And she says, oh, my God, it's my husband. I said, oh, this is not going to be good. She said, no, you have no idea how bad it's going to be. He's a policeman. Oh, wow. He's carrying a weapon. <laughs> and he was. Wow. And he burst into the door and he said, okay, I certainly hope you enjoyed yourself the last 20 minutes because it's the last joy you're going to have in the rest of your life. Pulled out his weapon and cocked. Wow. He said, come on over here. I want to, I want to shoot you real close so you can really feel it exploding in your brain. And I said to the guy, you know what? I get it. I committed the cardinal sin here. This, this is way past inappropriate. This is simply fundamentally wrong. And I made a huge, huge mistake. And I hurt you deeply. And I get that you have the right in your mind to end my life. But here's how it's going to go. If you are going to shoot me, you're going to shoot me in the back because I'm walking out of here now. And I did. I simply moved past him, my heart thumping like you couldn't believe, made my way down the stairs, never won't broke into a trot, just moved slowly and deliberately to my car, got in my car and drove away. And I got about seven blocks away when I stopped the car, opened the door, and lost my lunch. Wow. On the, on the roadway, thinking, oh my God, I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. But I had to make a decision. Who am I? And who do I choose to be? And there are moments in our life that are less dramatic than that, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> but moments in our every day when we're invited to ask ourselves the question, who am I? Who do I choose to be? Ah, I see. This moment in life was designed for me to address the question and to provide the answer and to live into my response, making it real in my experience. Wow. Never looked at life that way. It's a powerful thing. And I think for many people, they can't love in the way that you described because they can't visualize that way. They've, they've never, they've, ne they've no reference point. Um, and I think without being able to visualize that level of love there is no way really for them to try and bring that into the world except following something else that you said which was what's the blueprint how do i get here how do i achieve this and i think my answer would be you don't need to you already are that <laughs> you just don't know it um it's it is it, it's that it's literally a, a millimeter of, of change of thinking you know you... what's interesting, John? Go for it. I, I, I agree with you. I hate to interrupt you, but I'm, I'm, I'm tracking right with you. What's interesting is that almost every human being, I'm not going to say everyone, but nearly every human being who has ever fallen in love with another person has had that experience. Yeah. It's what we experience in the first moments when we fall in love. In those first moments when, you know, the blush is still on the rose, 
And, and, and when we feel that rush of love for another human being, we don't need, require, expect, demand anything from them whatsoever. We simply love them completely because of who we're seeing across the room. Some enchanted evening. <laughs> I'll rush to your side. Yep. See you across the room. But the longer we love someone, the more we start, at least in my own experience, adding mm -hmm. ingredients to the process. Yeah, I love you, but you know, I gotta I gotta ask you for these things and these things and these things and, and this, this and that and that. And and I, I love you if I love you if, you know, and but but I still love you, but my love has become a little bit conditional. And the longer I love you, the, the more conditions I'm going to have to add to the process. Why when do you in think fact, that is Neil? Why do you because think we're, because fear, because we're fear, because we are afraid. See, fear causes us to to become frightened of losing what we love, mm -hmm. and so the more we love someone, the more fearful we become that we will not be able to have that experience in our life. So we do whatever we can to maintain the security of that of that love. Yeah. And and if we're not careful, we can smother another. I did that in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a marriage that didn't work out because I literally smothered the other person. I shouldn't say literally smothered her, <laughs> but I figuratively smothered her yeah. with my, you know, attention and my demands, yeah. which I didn't really see as demands. I just thought them as isn't this how relationships work? No, but um, I, I, I lost that marriage. And it wasn't uh, the only marriage I've lost. And, you know, I, I, I lost a second marriage because of my, un, um, my misunderstanding about what love is. And I lost a third marriage, actually, for the same kind of... And I lost a fourth marriage, actually. And then it was, wait a minute, actually a fifth marriage as well that didn't work out. Right. But finally, no, no, wait, no, it was a sixth marriage that I also lost. People think I'm joking when I roll this out because I find a humorous way to share it. But in fact, it's true. I didn't have six live-in girlfriends, six you know, partners, housemates. I had six marriages, ring on the finger, eternal vow marriages that failed. Only now in my seventh marriage, 15 years into it, I finally found the formula. Oh, I see. Love a person for who they are, not for what you think you can get from them. Yeah. And you know what, John, not to brag, but just to give an illustration, my wife said something incredible to me about two and a half years ago that I'll never forget to this dying moment of my life. She she came home from an afternoon out. She was out with her mother, actually, and they were on shopping or whatever. And she came back home after her day away, and I got up from my chair to greet her. She said, oh, no, stay, stay, stay where you are. And she came over to my chair and sat on the ottoman in front of my chair, and she put my face in her hands. She held my face with her hands. She looked into my eyes, and she said, Four words I'll never forget. You are so safe. Powerful. I said, wow, what does that mean? She said, it means I can come into this house and know that no matter what, you are so safe. You will be upset, angry, judgmental, condemning, punishing. You are simply so safe. You love me exactly the way I am. It's magical. It really is magical. You it know. took me seven marriages to get there. Uh -huh. So, you know, we don't need to do that. I'm sharing this story so people will get, oh, I see. But here I am. 
I'm going to be 79 years old in a few weeks, and I have only one thing to say about that. So, oh, so soon, so smart, so late. Yeah. So listen, folks, to what this guy, John, has to say. Listen to what he's sharing, not just in this month's program, but in all the months that he sends his program to you. You think it's a coincidence that you found John? You think it's a coincidence that you're here right now? You think this is all accidental? Excuse me. Your soul brought you here. Yeah. There are no coincidences, that's for sure. And there's so many thoughts, and I know we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Unfortunately, it, it always gallops by and uh, on his sturdy white steed. But imagine, uh, what I'm imagining now is, you know, imagine if our churches loved in that same way. Imagine if our businesses loved in that same way. I honestly think that's the reason that I've managed to stay in business for 20 years through three recessions here in the UK, now through all the stuff that's going on. Is because I love the people that I work with. I love the people I serve. Um, you know, and it is, it's powerful. You can literally love people to healing rather than trying to force them and, you know, and, and, you know, force them to bend to your will. Because whenever you have to force someone to bend to your will, that's not true love. And you need to really learn what that message is. And, and that's exactly what uh, Neil was saying, that you need to ask yourself the question, what am I doing in this moment? Neil, I know we're rapidly running out of time. I've got three questions for you in the rapid fire. So the first one is, what is next for you? I don't know. I live in the moment. I don't want to know what's next for me. I don't have any plans. I, I'll, I'll let you know what's next for me when it arises. I love that. We, we have a mind that is attached to nothing and open to everything, and it's powerful. What advice would you give to young authors trying to find their way? Don't worry about whether you succeed or don't succeed. Give yourself permission to simply... Put into the world what it is you feel moved to put into the world and let it go at that. Divorce yourself from the need for outcomes or results. Fantastic. I love that. I've got, I've got a brand new book series that's coming out later on this year. I'll be sure to send you a copy, actually, Neil. Uh, if you're a lover of history, if you're a lover of um, the ultimate time travel adventures and books of the old, then and, and even the self-help and life principles we've been talking about on this show, you're definitely going to love this. And the final question. What would you like to hear God say when you arrive at those pearly gates? <laughs> How good to see you again. I love Welcome that. home. I love Welcome that. home. I wrote a book called Home with God and a Life That Never Ends. So uh, what I want to hear God say to me is, well, faithful servants absolutely absolutely and yours is a life well lived your books have touched people around the world i'm sure they will continue to do so and the amazing thing is if i can give anybody any comfort right now whether an author whether an artist don't be so worried about writing for or painting or creating songs for your audience today because a dear friend of mine who I never got to meet changed my entire life. He was called Wayne Dyer. And he died, I believe, within the last 10 years. But I encountered his works in 2021, and they changed my entire life. And guess what? I've now been blessed, realized to be guided, and I'm now having that privilege to go on and share his works, share Neil's works, share my own works, share a lot of the other works that are hundreds and hundreds of years old with people around the world. So don't be worried so much about today. Just, just do what you need to do and trust that you are being guided in every way. And I trust that God will take care of the rest. Neil, have you anything you want to say before we wrap up the show for today? Two things quickly. Number one, I knew Wayne personally. We were friends. Wow. And <laughs> I we, should have known that earlier on. <laughs> well, we we presented. We 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 weren't close personal friends, but we we certainly knew each other. We were we we presented at the, the same events for for years. We would meet each other on a regular basis and share stories and just be you know kind of colleagues is a, a good word for us. 
and he was in person, as wonderful, as complete, as magnificent as the messages that he put in his writing. Wow. Second thing I would, I would I leave people with is the answer to the question that I asked God when I first began communicating with the divine. What does it take to make life work? You've been saying, okay, you know, what is it I don't understand? The understanding of which would change everything. You know, tell me the rules. Tell me the rules. I'll play. I'll play the game. Just tell me the rules. God said, Neil, relax. It's very simple. Your life is not about you. It has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Your life is about everyone whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. When you understand that, you will know who you really are. And you will sit back and say, ah, yes. Yes. Thank you, God. Because you will know a joy and a sense of fulfillment and a sense of completion, the likes of which you've never known before. Because you will stop seeking. You will never again be a seeker. You will move from seek to source. That is, you will be the source in the lives of everyone whose life you touch of all that you had been seeking in the years before you understood who you really are. I didn't send you down there to be a seeker. I sent you down there to be a source. Yeah. So be a sorcerer because it's magic. I love that. I really do. Neil, where can people find you and your works? CWGConnect.com. Absolutely. And we'll put that link in the uh, the comment section below. Neil, I want to thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure. It really has. I hope we get to do this again because there's, I think there's so much more to unpack. But folks, that's all we've got time for. So I want to thank you for watching. Definitely go check out Neil's work. You can come and visit me on our brand new website, thejohnmorris.co.uk. Until next time, take care. God bless. We'll see you same place, same time for more of the Battles We All Face, Mind, Body and Soul podcast. Namaste, my friends. God bless.